Hi, good morning to everybody. Also for the people connected by Google Meet. Uh, now we'll start the third day of this workshop. As you probably remember from the agenda, uh, the day is uh, focused on uh, source localization and also brain connectivity with uh, normal lectures during the morning and also there will be a hands-on training session at the afternoon. So, uh, the first speaker will be uh, Dr. Carolina Migliorelli, in this case from uh, Eurecat, the Technology Center in Barcelona. Uh, and also I want to thank, you, he, to thank her for your uh, assistance and your attendance here in the participation in the workshop. Thank you very much. And well, other lectures will continue during the morning. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel Angel. Do you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's get started with this lecture that is titled EEG Source Imaging, a Practical Review. And well, a little bit of the agenda of what, what we will see today. First, a, a brief introduction on, on, the, on the problem. Then I will state some general concepts where all the most theoretical points will be assessed. Then I will talk a little bit about uh, some practical tools you may use to do, to do source localization. Uh, then some common frequently, uh, frequently asked questions that, that arise when, when doing source localization on, on, on this topic. Then we will do a, a brief Kahoot in order to see if the main concepts are, are um, understood at least a little bit. And finally, uh, if we have time, because we have a lot of things to say, uh, we will talk a little bit about some applications where localization may, may be used and, and was successfully used, okay? So well, let's get started with, with, the, with this, uh, what is about this EG source imaging. So um, basically, as you may know, because you, you assisted to the other days of the workshop, I, I assume, uh, with EEG, we are measuring the electrical activity of, of the brain, okay? And uh, the question that, that we are asking when, when we are uh, treating EEG source imaging is how we uh, transform from, from, from this, from, yeah, from, from this, from this electrical activity to these uh, activations in the brain, okay? So, just a little sum up of, of traditional EEG that I assume that, that you may know, okay? Uh, EEG is, is one of the oldest techniques for measuring the, ne the neuronal activity, the electrical activity of the brain. Also, um, it, it has a very good temporal resolution because it's capable of, of capturing brain function on the sub subsecond range. And we know that it's versatile, cost-effective, and portable also, okay? This is classical EEG. So, but then, when, when we start to use EEG as a neuroimaging modality, uh, when we start to have a high number of, of electrodes, uh, of EEG with, with high number of channels, also because uh, we, we start to have advanced head anatomy, uh, anatomy, anatomy modeling of the brain. I mean, for example, uh, the MRI techniques that, that allows us to have a real anatomy of, of the brain. And finally, because several sophisticated lo so source localization, local localization algorithms were developed during the last years, okay? So with all these, we are trying to, to solve this problem, okay, from translating into this electrical activity with, to this neural activity. But this uh, has several multiple and compa um, complex steps that today I hope that you understand a little bit more, okay? So general concepts about, about source localization, okay? First, uh, you will see that sometimes I, I talk about source localization and sometimes I talk about imaging, okay? A little bit of 
differences between what is localization and what is imaging, okay? First, starting with EEG source localization, okay? Um, is the problem that we are trying to solve with EEG source localization is identif identifying the brain locations, generating EEG signals using mathematical models, okay? So here we have this scheme, okay, where we have, for example, the, we are measuring the scalp activity with the EEG, as, as you know, and uh, we are measuring different sensors, okay? In fact, what we are trying to assess here is how these sources, uh, is where this information came from, the sources where, where this information came from. In this example, for example, we have the source in green that has, that has this type of activation and the source in, in red that has this other type of activation. So in fact, what we are measuring on the scalp is the mixture between the both, both signals. So here, for example, we are in this, in this sensor, in this posterior sensor, we are measuring most of the activity of this source mixed with some of the activity of this source. And on the other hand, on, the, on, this, uh, on this electrode located more in, in the anterior uh, position, we are measuring the activation of this, mostly the activation of this source and uh, some of the activation of this source, okay? So this is what we are trying to solve with localization. When we talk about EEG source imaging, um, is basically representing in, th in a three-dimensional brain uh, this activity, okay? And often overlay this activity with structural images of uh, magnetic resonance imaging, okay? So most, more or less, they are similar, but here we are dealing more with how, how, we, how we project this on the brain, and here is more a theoretical concept, okay? Okay. In order to, to understand what we are measuring, we need to know a little bit how the brain works. I assume that for the other lectures, you talk a little bit about this, but just for, just for remember you, the brain, um, most of the activity that we are measuring on the EEG is located on the cerebral cortex, okay? If we cut the, the brain in this, in this area, we would see the cerebral cortex as, as this area as this thick layer that, that is in covering all the cortex with all these folds that we find here, okay? It's, it's also called gray matter, okay? So the activity that we are mainly measuring with EEG is the activity that is happening only on the cortex, okay? And in the cortex, we have these pyramid cells, this, this type of neurons that are aligned perpendicularly to the, to the to, to the surface, okay? Well, to, to, the, to the surface of the brain. So for example, in this fold, the, the, the neurons would be aligned perpendicularly like this, and on this fold, it will be aligned perpendicularly like this, okay? So this is the information that we are measuring on the EEG. The electric fields that, that, that are uh, generated by, by these neurons. Then I will come back, back with, with this concept, okay? But of course, we also have all this space and all these tissues that are uh, between the cortex and the electrodes, okay? We have the scalp, the skull, and all these other layers where the cerebrospinal uh, fluid uh, come, uh, is, is circulating here. So all, this all, the, all the, these layers distort the EEG signal, and we have to taking into consideration this distortion in order to understand what uh, the information that we are measuring here, what, uh, what is explaining from here, okay? So just to sum up and to understand how the brain works. So what do we want to do? We want to uh, generate, to create, no? to, to find the, phys the physiological sources uh, where the electrical current is generated, generated at the cortex level, okay? So we want to generate 
this type of, of we want to un assess this type of activation, okay? So in order to assess this type of activation, what do we have? Well, we have the information at the, at the scalp or sensor level, okay? This is an, a topography of a high density EEG. Uh, I, I assume that you saw this type of topography of, of, of the activation of the EEG. And then we will come back also to, to the topographies and to, and to how, how we can relate the topographies to this, okay? But basically, we want to assess this, okay? We want to come from here to here. The first step to come from here to here is to know how to have a model, okay, of how the sources project into the brain, okay? And this is called the forward model, okay? The forward model, what measure is what kind of electric field is generated by a given source, okay? So basically, we need to know this model in order to finally obtain the inverse model. That Okay, so what, what I was saying is that um, the forward operator uh, has the, the units of the sensors and, and the sources, okay? Is that is, is this operator allows us to translate between sensors to sources. So this is what we have to, to assess, okay? So what do we need to obtain this forward operator? And we will talk point by point of this of these of, of these needs. Okay, first the head model, or you will see also in the literature that is called volume con conduction conduction model. Okay, second the source model. The source model is the which algorithm do we use to assess the sources on the brain? And finally, the sensor position. Okay, with this three uh, elements the head model the, le the electrode positions and the source model we are able we will be able to solve the forward problem and when we solve the forward pro problem the, the, the directly we will solve the inverse problem because we will have all the elements to solve it okay so let's get st let's start talking about the head model um, the head models okay um, here, here is a mistake. It's, it's not different forward models, it's different head models. Forward models and head models are not strictly the same because forward models, you need all these three things to obtain the forward operator. So here, here we have a mistake. Uh, now I, I, I saw it. Okay, so we have several head models and I list here the most common ones that you will see on the literature from simpler to complex, okay? And uh, let's talk about single sphere and overlapping spheres. These are geometrical models that, for example, in the case of single sphere, um, fit a sphere to the head of a subject, or in the case of overlapping spheres, we are fitting several uh, spheres to the, head, to the head of a subject, okay? And these are very simpler spherical models and as, because they are simpler, they are uh, easier to implement and the computational time that you need for these models are less, is less, but however, they are not suitable uh, for EEG because they are not very accurate. They are, re when, when you see this on the, on the tutorials, uh, you, you will see that often these models are used when you are using a, a MEG, okay? Why? Because MEG, that, is me that measures the magnetic activity, the magnetic activity do not get as distorted as electric activity by the, the skull and the scalp, okay? So for this reason, using uh, these models uh, uh, is, is, is okay, but in the case of EG, these models are not, are not enough to, to capture the complexities of the distortions of the signals, electrical signals, okay? So in the case of, of EEG, we have to go to more complex models. And we have the most famous models are the boundary element method head models and the finite element methods, okay? In the case, uh, well, 
this was in the case of of boundary element methods what we are uh, what we are considering are the boundaries of different of different head tissues okay so what we do is to assess the boundaries of the scalp of the skull and of the brain sometimes we assess the boundary of the white and gray matter and sometimes we just keep the cortex of the, su the surface of the brain okay in the case of finite element methods we discret discretize the entire vol volume okay uh, into small finite, finite elements that are volumetric elements okay uh, this needs more complex geometries but also this is more appropriate for example if we have to to model a, a brain that has a tumor that is not as homogeneous as a physiological brain for example so this model that is a little bit more complex would be more appropriate for this type of problems okay in any case for these two models we will need a, a mesh segmented anatomy okay to compute the model and what is a mesh segmented anatomy we will need the structure of the brain um, obtained via usually via mri okay and so I, I know i assume that you all know what is a um, an mri we can get the structure of the brain and with this and some computational tools that the, which the most common is free surfer but now there are a lot of tools to to do to solve this problem with machine learning and so on but uh, what, what we do here is to segment the brain okay here we have an example of segmentation where we have um the uh, in red the the head then here in in green we have the the the, sc uh, the, the skull sorry and in blue we have the brain okay so what we did is to obtain the different parts that are interesting for our model okay we did this segmentation okay in the case so in the case of boundary element methods this segmentation will be the surface of each one of these structures okay and but in the in the case of of finite element methods this would be a volume okay of the structure so this is more or less the difference okay so now we have this head model we we assess this head model and we have to choose which which source model we will use okay you will see that there are several source model models in in the literature okay i i classificate and several classifications of the source models also i classificate it today like this okay we will talk about single and multiple dipole models then we will talk about distributed source models and finally about the spatial filtering okay so well, here you have some images just to remember okay so let's talk about first to for to the simpler of the source modeling techniques and that is the dipole models okay now we will talk about of what is a dipole and what we mean by dipole here but the idea here is to fit a dipole and when, when we fit a dipole we fit its position on the brain its orientation and its strength okay so let's come back to the beginning of of the lecture where i was talking about the neurons okay the neurons in the cortex this is an image of the cortex i assume that you that you understand this image here we have the cortex that has this all these folds okay and the neurons uh, that are in the cortex these pyramid cells are aligned for example in this section are aligned uh, radially to the scalp okay and this this pyramid cells generate its its uh, electric fields here we have the the positive electric fields in the in the nucleus of the of the cell and the negative fields on the dendrites okay in fact we don't have one or two 
pyramid cells activating, but a lot of pyramid cells activating at the same time. So all the, the, the electric fields generated by these pyramid cells are summed up, okay? In the case of tangential, it's the same, okay? We, if, if we are in this part of the fold, the, the neurons are aligned tangen tangentially to this, to this, uh, to, to the scalp, okay? So it's uh, parallel to the scalp um, because, because the neurons would be aligned like this. So in fact, what we have is the sum up of several neurons, so we will create, we will, if, if some neurons are activated here, they will create a, a summed up electrical field, and if some neurons are activated here, it will create a tangent, a tangential field, okay? So, now we will see how this translates into the topographies, okay? How a dipole in the brain translates into the topographies. So here, in the case of radial sources, in this, in this case, okay, we will draw the dipole, for example, here, here is how the dipoles are, are drawn, okay, he, and, and what we do is to draw this, this circle and the line uh, is always pointing to the positive field, okay? So in this case, what we will have is the current flow moving in this direction and in this direction. Okay, so the negative field will be here and the positive field will be here. So what we will see on the scalp, we will see this type of image, okay? Uh, in, in the superior part of the, of the head, we will see the negative fields and in, in, in the bottom, we will see these positive fields, okay? This will be if we got an activation of this type on the brain, okay? In the case of tangential sources, the same, okay? Uh, we will have the dipole with the positive field uh, pointing in this direction, so the electric current would be traveling like this. So here we will see the positive uh, flow, uh, the positive voltage, and here we will see the, the negative voltage. So what we will see on the scalp, we will see something like this, okay? In the more, in the more anterior part, positive uh, values, and in the more posterior part, negative values, okay? So this is the general concept about dipoles. It's very simple, but it's also powerful for some type of problems. So, what we we do when when we, when we fit a dipole? Okay, in fact, what we have is this is this scalp uh, topography, and we have our brain and our head model. We assess our head model head model. Okay, so what we will do here to compute the forward model is to try to fit to uh, sorry to scan dipoles in the whole brain. Okay and to see how these dipoles, using this forward model, project in the, in the, in the scalp. So here, for example, we fit several dipoles, you know, these, these four dipoles, that produce these four scalp, uh, scalp measurements. So basically what we do is to search for the one that assembles the, mold, the most to the one that we actually have. So in this case, for example, we will choose this, uh, this uh, activation from here, okay? Basically, this is how dipole fitting works. It's very simple to understand, but in some, in some cases could be enough. And in which cases it's enough or it's okay to use dipole fitting. It's very useful when we have uh, we have to calculate one or very few sources, okay? Because imagine this, this is scanning, these possibilities that you may have in the brain, if you have several dipoles, the possibilities grow exponentially. So it's not feasible to do this with a lot of sources, okay? Uh, but when you, you know that the, the sources are few, for example, in the case of epileptic spikes, you can use this model in order to know how 
the, the, the position on the brain where, for example, these spikes are arising from, okay? Um, however, this, this model is simple, but it's not, uf, not, not useful uh, when we want to assess the activity um, where several regions of the brain are involved, okay? So in this case, when we want to assess the activity, for example, to do a connectivity analysis between three or four areas of the brain, we have to go to distributed source models, okay? So, distributed source model, uh, basically what, what we are trying to solve in our, this is our head model, we compute our head model, and what we are trying to solve is to estimate the activation, the activation at each one of the vertexes that we have here, okay? So, we have a lot of vertex, vertexes because because we have assessed this with, with a relatively high uh, spatial resolution, okay? The problem here is that this is a nil post problem, okay? Because we have much more sources than the actual channels that, or sensors that, that we have, okay? So this means that we have infinite solutions. So here I, I found one example that is not mine, is, the idea is not mine because I found it in another lecture, but I think it's very uh, good to understand. So in fact, what we are measuring here, no, when, when we are measuring the EEG and we want to estimate the sources, is that we are measuring the, sh the shadow of what is happening, okay? And in fact, here we may have some assumptions of how this, uh, this shadow may, may be generated, but uh, here, for example, is not what, what we expected, okay? This is an art, uh, an art uh, sculpture that made by Tim Nobel and Sue Webster in 2002, and it's good to understand. Of course, you won't have this because in the brain, you know some assumptions, and as you know some assumptions, you can add constraints, okay? So, this is what here, sorry, it's overlapping because I think the versions of of the um, of the PowerPoint. But but how we make this problem solvable using these constraints? So, okay, these constraints is okay. This problem that has infinite solutions, as we know some things about the biology of the brain, we can fit this problem and make it solvable. Okay, so for example, some type of constraints may be the smoothness of the transitions between the sources or uh, the source's strength, okay? Well, one of the mm, distributed sor source models that are more uh, famous are uh, the minimum norm estimate, okay? Um, basically, the, con the, mm, the constraints that minimum no norm estimate use is um, that it assumes that the sources uh, are with minimum current. We minimize the current of the sources. Uh, also, we minimize the residuals. That, is, that, that means that we minimize the error towards the measured data. And also, we minimize, we try to minimize the contribution of noise. By adding these constraints, we are able to solve this unsolvable problem. We make this, this problem solvable, okay? Then, you will also find in the literature different MNE generalizations with different uh, constraints added to this, okay? Such as Loretta, S. Loretta, or DSPM, and there are many more, okay? But most of them, no, not all of them, but these ones, yes, eh? but not all of them are based on MNE, but most of them, and what is mostly used today is, is based on, on MNE, okay? Okay? But, but basically, all these type of, of models manipulate the properties of the sources to obtain the most likely solution given the constraints and the data that we have, okay? We have, don't have time to go in, in a, a lot of detail of this, but, but in any case, just for, for you to know, okay? So here, two properties that, that this model have. First, as I said, you, the activity get estimated throughout the whole brain, and then something that, well, uh, we may need to know is that the all measure activity, including the noise that we are uh, having on the on the EEG, is lands in the source space. Okay, so for example, with these models, it's important to do a noise 
to assess and do the noise reduction techniques before because you you will have the the noise projected into the brain okay so it's important to reduce all this noise in advance okay and in comparison to this distributed source model are the sp special filtering methods and one of the most common uh, spatial filtering methods is the linear constraint minimum variance beamformer. That is the one that I will briefly explain here. Here the assumption is similar to the distributed models, but there is some difference. Okay, We have this, this grid of sensors and we want to estimate independently the activation of each one of these sensors. Okay. So, what we assume here is that all the sources are uncorrelated. And we do this by applying what the concept of spatial filtering. In the same way that when, you do, when we do frequency filtering, we want to, for example, if we want to keep this, if, if this would be a frequency, we, we would want to keep this frequency and eliminate the others. Here, the, the concept is, is the same but with a space okay so in each one of these uh, positions in the space what we do is to apply a filter ideally will be these these type of filters but well then in the reality these filters are, are not as ideal as, as we want and in the case of uh, lmc lcmb informer we try to optimize this filter okay but by minimizing the the variance and here what we would have is in each one of the positions, reduce the contribution of each one of, of each one of the other sources that are that are interfered, interference. Okay. Basically, just for you to keep with this concept in mind, what we are doing here is not only to uh, assessing the activation, <coughs> but also to uh, reducing the noise from uh, from from the sources that are highly correlated okay so everything that we find highly correlated throughout the brain will be assumed as noise and we will suppress it okay this is the general concept so finally what we will what we will obtain for each one of the sensors is this weight matrix that will help us to construct this virtual sensor in each one of the positions and we do this with all the grid that we have predefined a priori, okay? <coughs> Some of the properties. Uh, here also the activity get estimated on the whole brain, but the difference is that the beamformer is selective to the activity because it's filtering the, this assumed noise, okay? <coughs> But however, the problem here is that we need, for EEG, we need a precise forward model to compute the informers, okay? So this is only appropriate in EEG when we have the individualized MRI of the subject. We cannot perform the informer <coughs> with accuracy. We cannot perform the informer with accuracy if we don't have the individualized anatomy of the, of the subject, okay? But well, this is the, the last uh, method that, that I'm explaining today. So now we have the source model, we have the head model, and I will talk a moment about sensor position. That is something that may be obvious, but uh, sometimes uh, we have to keep it in mind, okay? So the positions, has a direct impact on the stability of the source localization. And this is important from a practical point of view when you are recording EEG, okay? So you can assess the positions with fixed, uh, with uh, these EEG caps that the manufacturers give you and some fixed um, points that then we can align to the, to the anatomy of the subject. However, uh, if you can, you can go to something a little bit more sophisticated, but available. At, at, at it's, this is an app, for example, from from Fieldtrip. That uh, I, here, as, as you say, you can, as you see here, you can, you can digitize the positions and have 
a three-dimensional assessment of the head of the subject. This is much more recommended than just using the fiducials and the, and the easy cap and the, and the specifications of the manufacturer, and it's quite easy to do. In this way, you will have the exact positions of the EEG, so it's something to keep in mind. And then, in more advanced studies, this is not usually the case, but in more advanced studies, you can use the MRI. You can put the subject. If you, for example, are doing a, an experiment with a FMR, fMRI and an EEG at the same time, for example, you can scan the sensor positions and this would and, and in this sense you would have the sensor positions exactly on the head of the subject but well this is not something that happens uh, all the uh, uh, usually okay okay so now uh, we finish uh, we have the head model we have the source model and we have the sensor position so with all this information we arrive and we have the forward model, okay, and then we have we will have the sensor activated on the space, and with this forward model and the information from the sensor, it will be straightforward to uh, assess the inverse solution, okay, and here we would have the activations. Okay, now some practical tools that you may find uh, on online. The, um, and I will talk about the ones that I believe that are the most interesting to explore. I assume that then in the hands-on training you will you will use some of them. Okay, so there are several tools to assess uh, source modeling. Here I, you have this this table with with all the with all the softwares uh, that are available. Some some of them are from an academic point of view and open and some others are, are commercial, okay? So if you can want to take a look. But, well, in the case, I, uh, the ones that I used most uh, are Brainstorm, m and &E, and Fieldtrip. Brainstorm is a, is a software that is very powerful. If you don't know a lot about coding, it would be the, the, the good option because you don't need practically to code anything, but you have to learn how to use the tool. But there are some very interesting uh, tools in uh, tutorials in internet to, to, to learn. So, but it would be, and, and for visualization is very straightforward. It's very easy to, to compute each one of the steps. So if you don't know how to code, I would go for this solution. Then, if you are used to coding MATLAB, maybe you can test Fieldtrip. That is, it don't have this graphical interface, but is but is very powerful also, and is 100% coded in in MATLAB. So you can use it as as plugin of of your scripts and and, and work with them. And then, if you are working with Python, you have most of the of the analysis that you find on field trip are are in ME in Python in this tool uh, in this package of Python that has all the most of the of the uh, algorithms that you will find on field trip and some of the ones that you will find on on brainstorm okay um, and then it's quite they are working quite together so then you can Sometimes if you need something from field trip, then you can import to, to brainstorm or even to ME. So there are three tools that are totally open and, and easy to work on. So this would be my, my suggestion. Okay. Here we have the typical work, work, workflow. When we work uh, practically, we will have this anatomical and spatial data that is the MRI. Okay, we will obtain the head model, the source model, and the source of positions. That is the things that I explained today. And then, of course, you have the other part that I assume that in the other in the other um, wo uh, workshops you you had uh, been explained about this um, about uh, processing the functional data, um, epoching, uh, filtering, and whatever analysis you need to do in order to arrive to, to something that then you can, uh, you will compute the forward solution with this and with this and this, you will compute the inverse solution. 
and then we will, you will have these nice visualization tools to see the activations on the brain. Okay, this is just the, the skip. Okay, I know. Okay, so I'm now some frequently frequently asked questions when we are doing source modeling. Okay. First, one question is, what if I don't have an anatomy? This is quite common because if you are doing a, an EEG assessment and you don't have access to an MRI, what you should do? Okay, the solution would be to do use a default template. And there is one that is very famous that is called the MNI brain. Um, where, and this, this brain was obtained with several normal MRI brains co-registered, okay? But keep in mind that if you don't have the anatomy, the localization may be less accurate. So you will have to take into consideration this, okay? But this would be what everyone does when, when do they do not have an, an anatomy, go with MNA brain. Okay, there are some, for example, if you have, if you have the, the head shape, that then that you can, ask, can assess the head shape with that, uh, tablet app that I showed you before. If you have the, that, um, what you can do sometimes is something that is called warping, okay? So you can warp the brain, you can uh, adjust the brain to the to this head shape and sometimes it, it's better, okay? But of course this, if you warp a lot, the, the precision of the, of the localization is not good. For example, in, in kids, uh, in kids, this is not this is not as straightforward. For example, okay. Um, okay, then something that for me at, at the beginning was also I didn't understood well. You will find sometimes that, that when we talk about segmentation, we will find also the concept parcellation. Okay, and what is the difference between parcellate a brain and segment a brain? Okay. Basically, the difference is conceptual. I mean, you will also, segmentation is what I, what I explained to you at the beginning is, for example, here you have this MRI and you obtain the different um, uh, structures of the brain, okay? The cerebrospinal fluid, for example, in this case, the gray matter or the white matter. This is a segmentation. Um, also, we could obtain the, the skull, we, we also could obtain the, the scalp or the head. But parcellation is something that what, what it does is to divide the brain in several small regions, okay? Sometimes these regions are functional related regions. For example, we can parcellate and have the motor region or, or the, the language areas, etc. Et and sometimes it's a structural parcellation also, okay? But this is in order to divide the brain in atlases because sometimes, when we are doing some type of studies, we want to assess, for example, how one brain function is affected, uh, for example, by some activity. So instead of using, for example, sensors positioned and in the brain and that's all, we can say, okay, we, posi we position, sorry, sensors, no, uh, sources on the brain. We position some sources here and these sources are overlapping some area. So then we can make assumptions uh, of what is being affected by a task, for example, no? So we use sometimes parcellations also to perform source estimation and, and to understand what is the, what that seed means that the brain is activated in one area or the other, okay? So this would be the difference between parcellation and segmentation. Okay, another typical question. What number of channels I need to perform source imaging in EEG? Well, <laughs> it's difficult to say. I search a little bit the literature today, uh, today these, these little days in order to see what, what people say is now because they are always changing. Uh, but what is accepted is uh, 19 electrodes is not enough uh, because the results are, are blue red and the localization, localizations may be incorrect, okay? So if you can uh, add more sensors, it would be better in order to have better results. 
32 or plus electrodes. Uh, is the minimum required to resolve a, a surface of seven centimeters of diameter that is quite big for a brain is is the size of a of a lobe of the brain okay so it's not the preferred okay mm, and some studies show this significant mislocation and blurring okay and so what is the minimum required well maybe go with 64 se sensors would be the the best approach or at least the, the least approach okay is generally accepted for several applications 64 and in case the detection and localization of high frequency oscillations and seizures of zones for example for example in the in the case of of epilepsy okay and then of course the best approach would be if you have available a high density eg that is not as common as the other ones as the other ones eg's but this, uh, the high density G is comparable, for example, to, to MEG in terms of localization and much more cheaper. I, I will talk about that then. Uh, and for example, in the case if you are uh, want to do source localization in kids, it's important um, uh, to have a high density EG because uh, we, we can we can have uh, several mislocalizations due to lower school resistance. So in the case of kids and babies analysis, it's better to go to high density EG solutions if you can. However, even with 30, 32 electrodes or even less, source localizations may give us, may allow us to give an insight about the underlying sources, um, especially when we have well-defined focal activity. So it's something that you may do even having even knowing to have that that you have the limitations that you have and also it's not only the number of electrodes but also the position where you put these electrodes okay uh, for example in the 2020 system um, that do, do not uh, include many electrodes on the on the posterior part in the inferior part of the brain this may uh, generate some mislocalizations so if you if you can change these configurations in order to have uh, mapped all the spatial resolution it will also be uh, something that that you can you can think about okay and well then i talk a little bit about uh, meg and well which is the difference between meg and eg in terms of localization uh, well the difference, main difference is the EEG is more affected by uh, signal dispersion through tissues, so, so you have to take into consideration this. So for mainly for this reason, we, cons uh, we, we recommend um, real anatomies. <coughs> but the good thing is that it's cost effective and widely available. Okay, MEC systems, I don't know if you know about MEC systems, but they are not uh, a lot of MEC systems in the world. They are mainly for research purposes. Uh, so you don't if you don't have this machine, of course, you won't be able to do this type of analysis. Uh, but the good thing about MEC is that it's not significantly distorted by tissues, so you can get this better spatial resolution. So you can, even with no anatomy at all, you could have good localization results, okay? However, it's expensive and less available, okay? So this would be the good things about men, but in fact, EEG is much more affordable for, for each one of the, for, for each one of us, no? The only thing, what I explained a little bit about Meg, because um, Brainstorm, well, the, the three of them, in fact, but mainly Brainstorm and Field Trip were built with uh, labs that that had have a MEC and they, you will see a lot of routines that are for MEC okay the difference between using that routines if you want to 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 use some some of the tutorials is always considering the head model you you are not able to use with EG uh, single spheres or, or overlapping spheres and but then you can do a boundary element method and, and go with the with the tutorial okay this is the main difference 
and then also talk about fMRI that is something that 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 is another uh, way of of localizing uh, sources okay but you have to keep in mind that the activity electrical activity of the brain and the change in blood flow blood flow and oxygenation that is what fMRI measure are not strictly the same are linked but are not the same so uh, there are two types of complementary techniques and used in different and different approaches okay the difference the main difference is with EEG we have excellent temporal resolution well uh, and uh, with fMRI we have low temporal resolution but high spatial resolution we can uh, the, the, the spatial resolution of MRI in in general is better than in EEG okay uh, and also well, uh, of course EEG is cost effective uh, compared to fMRI okay okay so now I will take a rest and we can do a, a kahoot with some of the um, with some of the main concepts okay so I I would just, where is the kahoot no pero yeah. Start. Thank you. Think today, or you know this concept from before. have 36 participants 37 the ones that are online can also join or not yeah 41 42 well 44 <laughs> 45 well, I think we can start. They can join after if I start or not. No, I don't think so. No? Well, let's get starting. Oh, one more. 47. Simon. 47. Okay. Now, yes, we start. Okay. Which of the poll better describes the following topography? We, this is difficult, but I <laughs> well, it's not so difficult, but I left to one minute. It's very, it's very small, no? <laughs> well, you can do it randomly and see <laughs> if you. <laughs> Let's see. This is pointing there. That is pointing there. That is pointing. Like this. Yes, it's very small. And this is pointing like this. Yo ya no me acuerdo. Okay. okay, well, 20 correct answers, it's okay, no, this, well, I, I don't have now the topography, but 
this one, okay? Because the positive, positive field was generated from here and the negative field here, yeah? Next question. Ah, no, no, now this, yeah. Me. <laughs> no, it's not me, eh, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, true or false. The informer targets the specific areas and remove highly correlated sources, assuming them to be noise. Okay, well, very well, very well. True, okay. It's a special filtering technique, so it removes the, the noise. Now, Eva, I don't know if she's here. <laughs> Which of these is not a synonym? Power operator, gate matrix, head model, lead fend matrix. Okay, head model, okay. Head model is just one part that we need for the forward operate, operator. Okay. But the, the forward operator or needs these other steps. Eva, it's also still winning. True or false? In children, fewer electrons may be suffice due to, due to the smaller head size, allowing enough coverage of the entire head. False. Okay, we need more electrodes because the tissue is is different. is is more soft and and this creates more more inaccuracies. Okay. Eva is still winning, and Tiffany and Sara. Which of the four is not needed to obtain the forward operator? Sensor position, the source model, the sensor activity, the head model. The sensor activity. Well, very well, very well. Okay. MNE use several constraints to estimate the activation at, at, at each sources. Which of the following statement is false? Think about this. I will talk. Perfect. This one was from the from beam formers, okay? Highly correlated sources are treated as noise and thus removed. Muy bien, Alejandro. <laughs> Sara is first place now. This is very...
What type of information are we mainly measuring in EEG? Well, yes, some can argue that we may measure some deep sources, but but it's mainly activity from the cortex, okay? The electrical activity of deep brain structures, some can be assessed, but it's not the, the common, okay? Sara, very well. True or false? We inform estimate activity across the entire brain, while MNE focus only on localized areas of interest. Is false. This was uh, MNE also estimates the activity on the whole brain. Dip Dipolis is the one that is localized. Okay. Okay. We have two questions more. What does what of the following statements describes better the forward modeling? I put a lot of time to this and it was not as complicated. Okay, it is this one, the forward model. You have the the other ones is uh, external measurements is I don't know. If you, it, this would be like inverse modeling, no? Uh, this this one, okay? The electric you you predict the electrical activity based of the scalp based on the sources that you know, okay? Ah uh, no, okay. Well, I think Sarah will win, but let's see. Uh, the puzzle. I don't know if I did this question correctly. So. <laughs> I hope that is it's easy. Cool. It's from simplest to more complex. Top simplest. Okay. Well, this was the order. Podium. Oh, John France. <laughs> Emma.
Sara. Well, congratulations, Sara. Well, we have just 15 minutes. I, I won't extend a, uh, um, a lot. Um, basically, what I wanted, well, the Kahoot, I, I think I, it went pretty well. OK, so I will go with the applications very fast, uh, just to, to see some examples, but it will be very fast, OK? Uh, here I, I put you some of the classical applications that you will find that, that doing a source localization may be useful. For example, in the case of epilepsy, and maybe it was one of the first cases that that localization uh, was used to, to localize this epileptic focus that sometimes it should be removed by surgery. So this would be one of the applications. And also in the in the field of epilepsy, but maybe also for surgery, uh, it's useful to determine 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 the eloquent cortex. Okay, the eloquent cortex are these areas, uh, for example, the primary motor area, the Broca area, uh, these areas that are eloquent that that have a function for 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 the for the humans, and it's important to determine and delineate them. Well, for example, if we have to do a, a surgery for for resection a, a part of the of the brain, so this is other uh, application for for these techniques. Uh, also for event related potentials, in order to see the, uh, where the activations of these potentials arise, uh, for example, sensory, motor, cognitive, etc., and also um, to assess. Uh, and perform connectivity in, in large scale networks. It's usually, uh, this is usually done uh, nowadays in, in the source level, okay? So this would be another application. And then just to show you two examples, this image is not very well, I don't know if you see the brains here. This is our examples of what I, I did do during my PhD and how I use, for example, in this case, the dipole modeling. Um, here, I what what I what we were proposing was a reduction a noise reduction technique uh, in order to eliminate some type of interferences. In, in this case, it was MEG recordings. Okay, so here uh, we use the pole modeling uh, in order to see how by applying a filter to to our data, uh, we were able to to reconstruct the poles that were generated by uh, interictal epileptic form discharges that are uh, epileptic spikes uh, to see how these spikes had a more um, rest, had more resemblance on, on what we expect from an from an spike when reducing this this noise with with an algorithm that that we propose there okay so it's for example a, a, some application no, here here you have when, when we reduce the noise when we when we did not correction we had these dipoles that are not feasible okay uh, we, when we did channel rejection for for reducing this noise we obtained um, some some dipoles that also weren't as feasible as as the ones that we obtained when we applied the automatic filtering technique okay so this was this was one of the applications. And other application that uh, also was developed during during my PhD was uh, for for assessing uh, by using beamformers also with negativity, using this capability of of filtering of the beamformers, obtaining these type of oscillations that were called high, that are called high frequency oscillations that are, that also appear on on epilepsy. Um, we use this 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 technique to obtain um, these uh, sources here. The, this is the source space, okay? These virtual sensors that we obtained with with MEC, uh, and we were able to detect these oscillations 
uh, that were detectable on an intracranial EEG, but were not detectable at the source at the at the scalp level. Okay, so by applying this filtering technique, we were able to see uh, this this this. Uh, high frequency oscillations on the brain. Okay, so this is another uh, application. Perfect. And now, yes, if you have questions, uh, Joan told me that we have some questions online. It's possible that using a distribute source model, such as min, uh, minimum norm estimate, would be preferable to be informing when the fault anatomy for the head is utilized, considering beamforming sensitivity models and presentation and potential introduction of error. Yes, uh, of course. If you don't have the anatomy in EG, if you don't have the anatomy of the subject, it's better to go with minimum norm approaches. Okay, with MEG, this is different, but with EG, it's important to have the anatomy if you want to perform the informant techniques. If not, it won't be, uh, having, you won't be having good results. Well, someone says false, but... <laughs> um, as far as we know... As far as we know, there are various options for dipole orientation, including constraint, loose, and unconstrained. Which method would be more useful and recommended when we don't have MRI data uh, for individual subjects and the head model is not very accurate? Um, here, well, I think it depends a little bit on the application. Um, I would go maybe for a constrained solution, uh, but but well, I I will. It depends on the application, it depends on the type of sources that we are wanting to estimate, uh, if they are simpler or or, or more complex, maybe. Um, yes, more questions here. Uh, I, one moment. If not, the, the ones for online won't hear you. Okay. Um, I don't know if you already said something about it, but um, I'm more I, interested in the pre-processing of uh, anatomical subject data. So, um, because I've been struggling quite a lot to understand like uh, what would be like a best rational stream flow for um, all these steps from the scanner of the MRI. So, uh, because there are so many software, so many ways to do it. And I was wondering um, what would be your suggestion? Because so far I am using like software to convert the files, decom files to other pro processing, uh, more easy, easily processable files. And then I'm using free surfer for getting the segmentation, but then I'm struggling with using other toolbox in MATLAB like field trip because there's no compatibility in the extension. So I would suggest to use uh, to try to search in, in brainstorm because they have some utilities to convert, for example, from DICOM to to the other. I don't remember now the extension that that you need to perform is free surfer. But I think and also you can perform the free surfer directly from from brainstorm. If free surfer is not working for you, because sometimes depending on the anatomy, it's not work well, you have you can also check something that I think is called fast fast surfer. Well, something if if you check on the literature, it's quite new, is uh, based on on deep learning, and is pretty fast to obtain the the segmentation, and this is also if this is if free surfer if you are not obtaining good results with free surfer, there are some new options, quite new options. But in any case, for the workflow of MRI to, and to obtain the head model, for me, the easiest 
approach was to work with Brainstorm that has this, all these uh, visual tools that also helps to you to know if the the anatomies that you are obtaining are are feasible, are, are logical, and and you can also, for example, perform their warping or realigning the the slices or, or re-slicing all these steps that are quite complex. You can you can do it there. I think better in, in a better way than with field trip, for example, that is not as compatible as as brainstorming with, with this. Okay, yeah, because I first started with brainstorm, but then I saw that it was like uh, not re um, really um, uh, easy to customize the process. I mean, it's a bit really automatic yes, and you don't really you have, know what it's doing. The problem with brainstorm, you can customize a lot, but it's, you have a, a, a little learning curve at the beginning uh, in order to know how, how to customize. But then, for example, then, then you can add uh, some some scripts uh, and and for example if you need a, a step that is not implemented in brainstorm you can do this scripting part if you go to a, i think they have an advanced tutorial on, on scripting that is quite good and and then they are quite active on on if, if you have questions uh, i know them uh, uh, because I, I i went there uh, for for some months and they are they, they are quite active um answering this this type of specific question so this is also an option okay thank you <laughs>